j'aimerais mieux la vie à deux. Un jour j'aimerais lui faire la cour si elle sortait de tous ses détours. De tous ses détours. Hello, gorgeous people. You're all so wonderful to be here. Um, you asked for her, and boy, did they ask for you. I don't remember how long ago it was that you were here, but can I just say, all the people that messaged me, when is Nicola coming back? And then the ones <laughs> that, that messaged me saying, why don't you have Nicola Redmond? Everyone loves Nicola Redmond. Where's Nick? And I'm like, I have her. She's on the playlist. <laughs> This is great for my ego because I just spent um, bedtime with my son with him be like, I don't want you to do bedtime. I want dad to do bedtime. I was oh, like, oh. no one loves me anymore. That's, <laughs> Can that's, I tell you about the larks? <laughs> that's, I think that's good for you. It keeps your feet on the yeah. ground. Because if you listen to all of us, you'd be like buying a tiara any day soon. <laughs> 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 but it's because we're so grateful. It's because what you give us is we live and die for our voices. And I was talking to a narrator today and they were worried about there was going to be a weather thing coming on. And it was like hurricane, first hurricane they'd ever been in. And I was like, wow, it's kind of exciting, but are you scared? Is it a little scary? Like, no, no, I don't know how much noise it's going to make. And if the electricity goes off and I won't be able to record. So it's like you ask a narrator, you know, mugger, somebody at knife point robbing my house as long as you don't do it during my damn recording hours <laughs> <laughs> you know to us leave no, no. <laughs> put the gun away <laughs> exactly you know I'll, I'll see you in an hour i've got to finish 30 finished minutes <laughs> please we're talking about larynxes for the love of god <laughs> that's all that you understand. at the end of the day you know yeah. so, but I want to start. I want to start. Oh, guys, for the record, you all know the rules, but in case we have anyone new on the call, um, if any, we had Zoom hackers for the first time last week. If it happens again, I'm going to cut the call off, join again, and I will let you back in and hopefully not let them in, but it shouldn't happen again. Um, because the link didn't go on Twitter. If you have any questions, I'm going to assume you're all chatting about what's going on, your children, your new puppy, unless you write question in big caps next to it. And I'll filter those questions through to Nicola. But I also want to get a little bit of dirt on her background, where she's from, the juicy stuff as well. So on that note, Nicola, how did you become the guru that you are today? Best <laughs> podcast host, beloved coach, accent genius, you know, friend to the stars. Um, how did you become, you, you were talking about school and you were saying you weren't a big fan of the normal homework. Yeah. yeah. You sounded a yeah. bit cheeky. Were you very confident? And um, I think probably my approach was I can get away with doing the bare minimum if I'm a bit cheeky and a bit funny do you know what I mean mm -hmm. like I was smart enough to, to not have to work that hard on stuff I didn't give a fiddlers about so on the stuff I didn't give a fiddlers about I didn't work that hard and I still got like a bay or an air or whatever um but it, because my teachers were always like you if you applied yourself to the school if you applied yourself I was like ah oh, come on I sure don't I'm sure what's maths really <laughs> I remember once um, my math teacher, Mr. Ritchie, said to me once, listen, Nicola, you're not going to have a calculator in your pocket all the time. <laughs> well, Mr. Ritchie. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so I was right. I was right. Were you in like, the way I picture it, being American, and I know a lot of people on this call are, we, did you go to school in Ireland when you grew up? Yeah, so Were I went like to a grammar really school in Ireland. With like a little suit you had to wear and everything and like really like yes. mean. If you, did you get hit if you got if you did something wrong? Oh, I'm not that old, Daniela. No, see, I, did thought, I, get hit. I thought Ireland, because no. <laughs> my husband's from Scotland, so I hear stories about growing up. I was the north of Ireland, so yeah, I, I didn't go, I'm not a Catholic, so I didn't go to like a crazy nun school. Sorry oh, if there's okay. any nuns in the room. That might, I think that nuns. might be, um, I think some of the religious schools were maybe more strict. Yeah, well, where I came from, unofficially, all schools were integrated religion-wise, but actually 
on officially they were but unofficially there were definitely protestant schools and there were faith schools <laughs> and i was not a catholic not really a protestant either to be honest but we'll not go down that road i can't really be honest with either side <laughs> we lived there um but i was on the other side of the fence so okay. there weren't any crazy nuns there were just um a lot of had some really good teachers who yeah. knew that i worked hard when i wanted to i worked hard at music i worked hard at english um I can't even remember my other A level. <laughs> I thought is that Be because you're a comedian as well. Were you the class clown? Yes. <laughs> no, I, I definitely <laughs> attempted to be. Sometimes it landed, and sometimes it was an absolute catastrophe. But um, uh, I was ch charming enough to get my way through without annoying anybody. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. sort of keep keep them all close. I remember I remember hearing um an interview with. Oh, uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, and she said the best advice her mom ever gave her was, if you're good in school and work really hard the first few weeks, you'll get away with anything, you know? So I think what I did was just like, <laughs> be friendly and nice to everybody and like not be any, not be horrible, which is pretty easy that if you're like a long way. human being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were like, look, she'll be fine. I did have to fight for, um, I had to go into the headmaster's office because I wanted to only do three A levels. And at the time, my school, you were supposed to do four or five. And I only wanted to do three. A levels is like the top sort of before you leave to go to uni or tertiary level education. I wanted to do three because at the time I was doing like two or three shows outside of school and like oh. all sorts of other performing things. So I was like, I had to go in and do like a presentation about how I believed all my extracurricular activities were like my fourth and fifth A level because I wanted to go to school. You need to do performing arts. The performer, so I had to Did go in and like, work? yeah, I think he just wanted to get rid of me to be honest. The I headmaster going to the headmaster, who's this big, sort of scary dude in a big robe. Uh, but he didn't even know who it was because as I left, he was like, he literally was like, Oh, that was a great goal at the weekend. And I mean, you mean Kerry, I'm not Kerry because I looked like this girl called Kerry. So I did this whole presentation about what How I wanted to do with my you? life. Uh, it would have been A levels 18, so 16 ish. 15, See, 16. That, do you think it's fair to say that you were a director used to say this you were one of, you had something about you that do you know what i mean you know those kids in school they have something about them they kind of right i know where i'm going like i was definitely determined yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i had spent my entire child my entire time at school i'm sure people in here might be, i don't know might be the same going yes but what's your backup yes but what's your backup plan yes 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 we know you do that but watch your back do you want to be a teacher and when you went into um weirdly i am like and i never saw that coming so it's interesting i mean i did know more than i think um but when you went into our careers library at school in ireland it was like teacher doctor nurse dentist farmer or law those were like the options do you know that was it and i do sometimes wonder if there were more uh exotic interesting options even something like something in publishing or books or yeah you know, these days but, i'm sure it's all like game design and yeah. coding but our I parents only knew what they knew. do you know what i thought my parents wanted me to be an attorney or a doctor my whole life and i was like i'm an artist i'm creative and then when i was like 22 years old I found out that their dream for me was to become a dental hygienist or something in the local government so that I would get good benefits. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really glad I didn't know that. Mm, yeah, the it's only benefits cool. I brought my mom and dad were um, tickets to really bad friend shows. <laughs> That's the only benefit I really got. They were fully buying me though, like for um, all their, all their, um, whether they, I think they think it's the right thing to do now. They just always were like, she's going to, as my dad said, plow your own furrow pet. He was a farmer. So he was like, there's, well, there's not a point. I was trying to smush you into a doctor shaped hole. Oh, I love your dad. Yeah. Did you have any yeah. brothers and sisters? Yeah, one brother. And we all sort of live here now, like the Waltons in, in <laughs> Bushnock, where I live now in the north of England. So it's like three little properties on the same bit. And we live in the, Big bit. There's also a bed and breakfast where I'm running my retreats, and my mum and dad live in a little cottage on the end, and my brother lives in a little apartment. So it's like, hey, family. The problem comes in, I think, is when the accent is the minor characters, because I think now the, these days, and people send emails all the time. They're like, if it's a main character, somebody asked me if I could do Native American, and I was oh. like, no, honestly, if you want Native American, 
I'm sure there's a hundred Native American, strong female protagonist, Native American. That would be a dream book Ooh. for the right person, not for a valley girl that grew up going, oh my God, gag me with a spoon. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but if it's a secondary accent, then we come to you. But yeah. what I want to know is how you became you. I mean, because how did you go from stand-up comedy to, I mean, was this a surprise? When did this become yeah. like what you wanted to do? I was always doing wee skits, I suppose. Not like, hey, everybody, put your forks down and, and watch me. Like, I didn't like, I didn't like um, party tricks or any of that, but I definitely make pe liked making people laugh. Like, I've always had a, I got a real thrill out of that. And it came reasonably um, naturally in some form in most <laughs> environments. Not all, but <laughs> most. Um, and then I went to drama, I went to uni and I did three years of performing arts. Then I went to London to specialise in musical theatre at drama school. So I was a twirly, really. I wanted to be in the West End. Um, oh, and then I got musical. The end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got in the West End and I was like, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. I'm not getting the parts I want because I'm too tall or too curvy or my boobs are too big for that dress or your voice doesn't fit what you look like. or But what you can play is all the other seven characters that we can't afford to cast individually. <laughs> So can you play those three men, that dog, and those three women? Dodgy goth <laughs> so, prisoner number four. Yeah, yeah. So thing. I was like on and off with hats and wigs and like capes and dresses and, you know, and that was me kind of in and out doing like just finding my way and acting the leg again, but in different guises. And that was fine, but I wasn't like, this isn't why I wanted to be in the West End. This isn't why I'm staying up till 10.30 every night, because usually I'm in bed by like half eight. And that's another realization. I got there and I was like, I hate working in the evenings. Why did I ever think theater was the right route for me? <laughs> <laughs> I want to be in bed. This is terrible. What am I going to do in my life? Up? Uh, Are you like a son? morning person? But yeah, I sort of always have been. But then I had a child who decided the day starts at 5 a.m. So, and he's nearly five now. And we're, we're just getting past six. And that's because we're bribing him very heavily with a trip to Diggerland. <laughs> Can you not put cartoons on for like three hours and sleep till eight? <laughs> that makes you a really bad parent, Daniela. I'm allowed to. Like this at the weekend, I don't sure. have kids. <laughs> at the weekend, cartoons happen, but during the week, and actually, it's all right. We're we're reasonably early up anyway, and we got all this homework done. But anyway, that aside. Um, I then had, this is t such a cliche, but I had a really horrible relationship. Oh. <laughs> it ended very badly. And I was like, I couldn't feel any worse than I do right now. So I'm going to do a stand up comedy course. <laughs> That'll cheer me up. <laughs> and I can't feel any worse with a room full of strangers, like <coughs> kind of quietly tumbleweeding in front of me than I do right now from how this bleepers made me feel. Am did I right? it help? Did it help? Oh, I bet it did. Oh my god, yeah, because yeah. turned out I was really good at it quite quickly. <laughs> and yeah. I got on stage in front of a lot like 200 people and they all laughed a lot. And I was like, oh shit, this feels nice. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you as, at this time? Uh, I'm not trying to age you, I mean, just generally. 22, 23, maybe? That's a very exciting. Yeah, so it was the biggest rush I've ever had. Like, yeah. early, everybody should do stand up. I know Diane's done a wee bit. Like, it's just such a such a rush. It's like such. It's amazing. And I was very lucky because being Irish, you know, it's, people like it kind of regardless of what you say. In a way, like, you know, I, I used that very very heavily <laughs> to my advantage. And I was very hack and played silly songs on the ukulele and took the piss out of my mom and my family and all that classic kind of very <laughs> traditional stuff like it wasn't groundbreaking at all but people had a nice time on a saturday night and i got paid money for it so that was do, you, do you never want to go back and do it do you not get tempted to do it again no not really i think you really got to the point where i was getting paid and having to travel around and stuff and um you used to, i was enjoying it. it was great but then i stopped because and this is where i get suspicious right so I was do I was in a double act in a bit of double act stuff with my friend Amy, mm -hmm. and um, I'd met my husband doing stand up as well. He was a stand up. He was a very different stand up, very kind of alternative weird stuff. And um, we had a relationship. We um, were living together, and we accidentally got pregnant. <laughs> Don't know how that happened. Um, anyway, 
I stepped back from doing stand up. I stepped out of my double act, and he stole her from me. <laughs> not not romantically. I mean, comedy wise. Oh, well, <laughs> so, it's better than her stealing him from you. I know. Yeah, I'm just glad she's still in my life. She's amazing. <laughs> but like, so I stopped doing stand up to have a baby. So you're stuck and... with the baby, and he's up there with your partner. <laughs> yeah, being really really good. So like, it's fine. <laughs> totally fine. It's just a really funny origin story, I think, for them. It's just like, so how did you meet Amy? Mm, I still did they get? Did they get a little? Did they? Were they good? Were they good? To, They're amazing, not, yeah. Because you know what you could have done going up there with a the big bump. You could have. We really did a, made bump. a smash. Yeah, me and Amy did a few with my bump, and it was fun. But um, no, they're doing really well, and like they're like developing. Oh, they're still, they're still a team. Oh well, they're still together. Yeah, they got nominated oh, wow. for the comedy award in Edinburgh, like in the last Edinburgh that happened, and they're developing a TV show, and they've done a Radio Two comedy pilot, and they're doing a new game show on Dave. Like they're doing it. Oh, so that's <laughs> like, cool. So you didn't lose yeah, your yeah. friend, or okay? Oh, I got no. worried for you for a minute. No there, way. The story that's going. why I can talk about it so jovially <laughs> because everybody's happy this way. Um. Yeah. So yeah, but so, then, so that's what I was doing to stand up. So you were doing comedy. So then you had a baby, and then then did you think, what am I going to do now? Or were you already so busy? No. So I was it? I was doing voiceover before I started stand up, and then the two went quite nicely together. You know, stand up in the evening, voiceover in the daytime. And while I was sort of footing around doing that, I found this course at Central School of Speech and Drama where I'd gone to do musical theatre. And it was like an MA voice studies course. So it was like a, a, a year long master's in vocal pedagogy. Right. I was like, that looks good. I wonder, can I get on? Because unbeknownst to me, it was just like mad world renowned course. I had no idea. I was and like, oh, pedagogy, remind me, because we had this in the first call. And I think Austin's told me it's the health, right? Vocal health. Pedagogy is the art of teaching, it's studying how to oh, be a okay. teacher. Okay. And this was vo voice pra MA voice studies. And part of that was the pedagogy. So, you know, it's not just about being a voice nut and being a coach. It's about actually having done a year studying how to teach and the theory of teaching and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's one element that's really heavily weighted in the course. You learn all of that stuff about being a teacher, which is good. Because up until that point, I taught nobody anything. Um. <laughs> and that was terrifying. <laughs> Such a terrifying like role to step into, and I think I still battle with that these days. You know, seven years on or whatever. So, so basically, I went back and to, and that was when I suppose I earned my started to step into the world of being utter voice geek. Um, um, Did you just love it? And that was when like oh, was I loved it. Because you yeah. just loved when, it. What did you love about it? Um, I loved that it made sense to me because I used my voice daily whether it was stand up or whether it was uh, voiceover, I, I always use my voice. And I was learning this stuff that completely backed up and underlined all of the stuff I was doing and actually enhanced my ability to do the thing that I really enjoyed doing and made me better at it. So I didn't actually do the course thinking, I'm going to be the greatest voice coach the world has ever known. Um, it just happened. I, well, <laughs> I did it, <laughs> I did it, am I right? I did it thinking that like, I'd get to know more about my voice. And I actually went because I wanted to be, I wasn't interested in voice technique, actually. I wanted to be a voice coach, uh, uh, an accent coach. I wanted to be like on set next to Brad Pitt, you know, like helping him out. <laughs> and but you ended up doing that with a lot of stars, didn't you? Not on set, really. I haven't done much on set stuff. I've done one-to-one -one stuff with reason, with some high profile people, yeah. but on set, set stuff often involves having to be away quite a lot and a lot of travel, unless it's UK yeah. based. And because I left that course and got pregnant <laughs> quite quickly <laughs> by accident, uh, there was nowhere I could go. <laughs> I wasn't going anywhere. So uh, that changed my direction a little bit. And I basically jumped into any job I could get in the north of England because we moved up to Manchester from London. Isn't and I went think straight about into full time. Think about the straight. fate of that. If you had yeah. left that course and gotten pregnant, because what you're doing now, you have way more control. You're completely autonomous. You're a business owner. You have a name in the industry and you have potential to, I mean, grow exponentially. Whereas if you'd mm -hmm. taken that route, you would have probably gone and met some really cool, famous people on set and seen some great countries. But you never would have, you always would have been the side person 
that people very rarely hear about, you know, doing a very specialist job. And then if you ever quit that and didn't want to travel anymore, you kind of would have been, you know, reinvent, yeah. you have to reinvent yourself. I think there's ways of making both work. And I don't think anybody goes into any particular element of coaching wanting to be known for it, like a name. I don't think anybody goes into it going, I'm going, I want to be the best and most well-respected voice teacher out there so everybody knows who I am. I think you, you go into it going, I know this stuff. I want other people to know this stuff. And whether that's on set with some big actor or whether that's a load of naive, overconfident, about to have the bubbles burst first years at drama school. Yeah. Like we all go into it with the same goal. I think what's happened over the last year is that um, there's been a, an ability to package what I've learned and known over the last five, yeah. six years, working with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of voices and people and different sort of personalities and abilities to to package that into a way that's more accessible to lots of people. And my whole MO with, with voice work, having sort of been through it with drama school myself, training in it and being like, I don't know what voice works for. It feels all a bit highfalutin. I'm not sure if it's really for me. And oh God, this woman and all that cheese cloth. Ah! Like it felt really, even though I was doing it, I felt really out of reach to me and I, and I and it didn't feel worthy and I didn't really understand it properly. And I don't think I was in the place to give over to the exploration that I needed to in hindsight. You know, you go through a lot when you're, when you're young. Um, and I don't think I was actually in a place to really submit to it as much as I think often you need to. Yeah. Um, what I want, all I wanted to do, once I'd gone back to train in it and understood it more and experienced it in a more open and sort of present way, was make it like, I was like, everyone fucking needs to know about this. <laughs> like, See, I love that like, because it's motivation, isn't it? I, it's, I love that. It's, it's the, your why is sharing what you know because you're so in love with it. Whereas my thought when you talked about your career shift was, oh my God, you've got autonomy. You're in complete control. You can like be your own boss, which is obviously my why. But <laughs> but the but we you all approach things, and I think approaching something for the pure love of it, which mm -hmm. is so pure. I love what I'm doing, and I want to share this. And um, I don't want to forget. I've got a question. I don't want to interrupt you, but it's moving up in the top with people's comments, and I don't want to. I don't want to lose it, okay. and it ties into what we talked about in the beginning of the show. And I think this could be a really good time to to bring it up sarah had asked um about what is the best approach but after the question let me kind of fold that up into something what is the best approach to take to acquire the feel of an accent dialogue dialect or a hint of it for narration and that brings me to before the call when we were saying that if it's something you love I took Nicola's accent course. Oh my God, if she does another one, I think she's in the middle of one right now, but jump on it if you're a person that wants those skills and abilities. And I'll let Nicola talk about um, what parts of that can answer Sarah's question. But I have learned about myself that there is a lot of knowledge and I am really excitedly interested for about three minutes in almost all of it. But, <laughs> um, but I the things I really love are the things I go back to, but they're things that you need, like the vocal stack that Nicola did for me. It's simple. It's literally three tiny things. And if it was any more, I wouldn't still know how to do it or be doing it. But because it's so simple, it's quick and easy. So, and, and that goes to Sarah's question, because Yes, if we have to do a major accent, but we get hit with a hundred million side accents. How do we, is there any way you can please condense what you yeah. as a lover of all these subjects knows into what somebody, what could we keep in mind? Like what very, very basics could we keep in mind as far as secondary accents before we then, and at what point would we have to go, uh, -uh I have to go get someone because this isn't. Yeah. Okay. So there's, I think there's a couple of ways to approach a question like that. One is like the practicalities of, of what it actually means. 
So like you say, some of them are secondary tertiary characters with the odd line here and there. Yeah. And I think with those, you've got to trust that there's a way of embodying the feel of the character and the accent without getting it completely perfect on the one hand. Or if you're one of those people who's good at accents, it's only one line. You might be all right if you book an accent coach and go, I've got 68 accents, one line each. Let's do this, <laughs> you know, and, you know, so there's a couple of ways to go about that. Um, I think for me, generally in, in audiobooks, I'm with accent coaching, accent learning, is people actually really underestimate how much you need to listen to accents and just always be tuned in and listening and absorbing and noticing and becoming aware of. Often, I'm surprised by the amount of people who come for an accent coaching session and they've not listened to it yet. You know, and, and I get why, because you think, oh, I'll just go and someone will just teach it to me, it'll be fine. But actually, listening to it is like the first step. So if you can start to collate some really good places that you feel you can go to to collect accent samples or listen to accent samples, that's a really good start. And also the amazing thing about accent work now in terms of finding samples is that we have access to the entire world. So um, you can always be studying accents all of the time, uh, which is nice. Um, yeah. And, you know, depending on whether it's socially acceptable or appropriate, you can always be listening and mimicking. And I do that a lot. Like, I've almost got myself in trouble in real life doing that. Yeah, I've been told don't do that anymore and I'll get a divorce if I keep following my husband around talking Scottish. <laughs> or, you know, what, what, what's your real love, him or the work? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and, but also the listening is a good point because I realized something the other day. I'll be watching a show here, but I've been over here 20 years now. I would not be able to tell you if it's an American or an English accent. Or I would have to stop and actually think I cannot hear the accent anymore. I'm so mm. used. I can't tell the difference. I have to look things up constantly because I can't tell you if it's American or English. It's blended in my brain. I can hear your accent. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? I can't hear Scottish. And I can't hear British. And I think you have to listen. But when you're so used to things, sometimes it's... Yeah. It's also about doing different types of listening. Like we talk about kind of active listening and passive listening in accent work as you do in life really. But you know, you can listen and absorb stuff and, and take it in and not think about it. And then you can also spend one minute just going, what the hell was that? And then just tuning in and yeah. listening to it, repeating it, noticing what's going on, thinking about how it might be different. And in terms of the, the actual approach to accents, the thing that I find the most powerful is the stuff that I take from about the physicality or the shape of through yeah. which you're sending the accent. So the shape of the articulate is basically the tongue, the lips, the jaw, the soft palate. The That's the bit I remember part. from your class the most. Standing yeah. in the mirror and not the church because they really grossed me out. But the standing in the mirror, I don't like knowing anatomy. I don't want to know what's in there. Fine. Don't but, worry. but the the way it feels, that was like really Yeah. So the physicality in terms of the shape through which you send the sound, I think is hugely beneficial in uh, audiobook work where it's quick, 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 this one, that one, the other one, because it gives you something to physically set the accent in. And then if you can get really comfortable exploring the different options with the shape of the accent, what's happening with the tongue and all that kind of stuff, it can sort of shortcut a lot of the sound changes for you so that then if you don't have time to learn all the vowel changes, the consonant changes and all that kind of stuff, you've got something that feels different to your own at least. And that's the key. It's understanding that you also need to study your own accent and, and have a feel and really understand what's happening in your own shape before you move to another one. Um, but working on that can be really beneficial. And Knight, I don't think the book's here. Uh, Knight Thompson Speechwork do some amazing work around exploring what's going on with, they call it oral posture and sort of finding the different setting of an accent, breathing through it first, feeling the breath through it, then sighing through it, then vowels, what sort of vowels are in the area of where that tongue happens to sit for this accent? What sounds can you make with that oral posture and what sounds can't you make and all that kind of thing. And that's really interesting because, you know, with Northern Irish now, for example, my tongue position is habitually higher than 
uh, say RP. So I know if I'm going to a standard English Southern variant, whatever they're calling it these days, of RP, I know that I need to lower my habitual tongue position as a starting point. And if my tongue is lower and I'm not even really thinking about making the accent already, I can't say mice, which is my mouse file, because my tongue isn't up there. Like, right. my, so I start to explore and experience what the the sound might be for that. So like, um, it's about understanding those shifts and being able to hold those shifts and exploring how that can have an effect on the accent. So then you don't have to think too much about the sound change. I mean, I'm really being, you know, um, reductive here. But but, yeah. uh, but, I, but some of us need that. But also, I think I heard it from you. You said something fascinating on your like group thing once or something. And I never even considered this. Now it helps me that I'll be embarrassed if this wasn't you, but I'm sure it was. But that the I'll place, anyway. where, okay. <laughs> but the, like the place where the accent comes from informs the accent. So like if you're from a sunny, like Southern place, they're relaxed there and so you keep in mind the personality of the place that they're from yeah and that helps me find my way into because I'm going from personality of the character the accent just becomes a part of that it was you that said that wasn't it I know yeah. it was I say this with the caveat that um with all approaches to accents everybody finds a different way in and everybody finds a hook that is individual to them some people might be the setting some people it might be the rhythm and the music and the intonation some people it might be the vowel sound some people it might be the context of the accent i think what you're talking about there is something that is part of a bigger conversation and investigation that you need to have before you start on an accent if you're doing it really in depth if you're doing it for one random line in an audiobook like do it a leprechaun and move on you know but like <laughs> It's about context. Like Jan and Edda in the How Did Accents book say, I'm paraphrasing, something along the lines of um, accents don't exist in a, in a vacuum. They're like living, breathing entities mm. sort of influenced by culture and politics and history and environment and geography and all this kind of stuff. Now, there are some accent coaches who are like, it's ridiculous. Just because someone's from the south of America doesn't mean they all talk really slow because it's really hot. Like, you know. Oh, really? So is it like a there are some people, there are some people. There are some people who think that's reductive and silly. Oh, okay. But there are... <laughs> there, no, it's okay. And I think it's important to talk about these things. There are some people who think it's an important and interesting part of the context to look into, depending on the character you're playing. And for some, it's a really interesting way in, especially if it's very different to your own. And listen, we, we can't make, we can make no sweeping statements that everybody from X place sounds like Y mm. in the sense, in an accent way, or a personality way. It's like saying everybody from New York is really energetic and brusque. Everybody from the South of America is really like relaxed and chilled because it's too hot to be anything different. Like, but we but can't, when you're but, narrating uh, a long book, some and we all have to do it in a way, like the quirky, annoying best friend, the strong male protagonist, the love interest, yeah. the the beautiful yet vulnerable female protagonist that's going to exactly. end up strong in the end of the book, the hardcore detective. You know what I mean? We all do that, but then they they nobody's told the characters their stereotypes, so we have to get to know the characters individually. That's the yeah. thing that Johnny Heller would and it's all about. yeah, and it's all contextual, and it's all for audiobook learners, particularly related to the you know the quality of the writing and what you're given, the material that you're given, and if they have written it from the archetypal angle of relaxed southern yeah, bell yeah yeah then you're going to find an accent that you feel represents that so what you say about the environment i think is really interesting thing for people to explore but you don't present that to people going everybody from wales is sing-songy because there's lots of hills and <laughs> um, because that's kind of ridiculous yeah. but there's an interesting connection there you know, and you're right about the writing because I've had people not write any accent. Every single person in the book is written in exactly the same way. But then they say this person has a deep Tennessee accent. 
but there's no differentiation in the in the writing so you're yeah. having to add something when the words aren't um i don't want to forget we've got because i knew the questions would come in fast and hard for you so we've got another question link from nancy link later her method and training what is your opinion as a professional oh gosh <laughs> i feel like that's loaded i feel like somebody <laughs> has a really strong opinion on link later and wants to share it um okay having had the pleasure of working with Kristen um a few times um she is a was a remarkable practitioner and she codified and um brought into the mainstream the idea of voice training you know she was there cicely berry was there and they fought and they pelted their way through peddling this remarkable stuff that you could explore that was incredibly beneficial for um actors and performers and speakers and politicians and they were there at the coalface basically pioneering my role you know 100 years ago <laughs> 90 or probably 100 years ago now you know christian would have been 100 she was and women she was were barely able to work yeah exactly like I mean, insane. So, okay, 100 is too much because that means they would have been doing it when they were zero years old. But you get the point. <laughs> you get my point. But like, still, when women were yeah. expected to vacuum and keep yeah, a tidy Yeah, like Edith Skinner and all these incredibly st fucking strong, like yeah. Sis, Sis Barry and Kristen Linklater were not to be messed with. Yeah. And women were, um, put it this way, women were not encouraged to have voices. Yeah. Exactly. And they were there giving everybody a voice and it was amazing. Um, I have done a lot of Kristen's work with her, with other practitioners who are um, designated link later teachers and all that kind of stuff. And it's remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. Um, and when you learn it from her, you see how, well, you experience it with her at least, because I didn't do enough to say, I'm not a designated link leader trainer, but I had some sessions with her while we were doing our course. Is, is that you experience her actually her. her in person? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And sis, wow. and sis Barry. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's, she's amazing. Um, you really get to the heart of exactly like what you say about what you seem to hear in me in the sense that it's about me telling people, how, like sharing this information. And Kristen was the same. Now, sometimes people find, because Kristen's work is progressive, all voice work is progressive, but her stuff, like her books don't even have an index because she wants you to go from start to finish to do the whole thing. And I completely understand that. I struggled with it at times because I wanted, I struggled to understand how to apply it in like a troubleshooty kind of way. But I think that's because I didn't know enough about it. And like I said, I've not been through the designation process, so I probably don't know it as in-depth. And when you when you experience it with her, you see exactly how she can use it in a way that's really fast and works really well. But rather there's no than cheat pressure. sheet. And she knows it. But <laughs> the, the, yeah, there's no cheat sheet unless yeah. you're her, unless you've developed yeah. <laughs> it. And you're a really highly sort of qualified um, link letter practitioner. Yeah. Times have changed a bit for us coaches coming through in the last, I would say, 10, 15 years because no longer there was a bit of a it's Kristen or it's Fitzmaurice, um, Catherine Fitzmaurice, which is another um, methodology of voice training. And it's like you pick, you choose, you have to pick one, you have to hitch your wheel to a wagon or whatever that saying is. Because, and, and that was it. Whereas now there are loads of practitioners who've come through, who've taken bits of, developed, studied, started their own little methodologies and everybody's a bit magpie but also credits where everything's come from and ultimately there's not really anything new under the sun but we take things and we work in our own practice and we kind of blend stuff to work for us people like barbara houseman like she's very heavily influenced by sis barry and kristen linklater and admittedly so but has also got some incredible insane stuff going on at the moment about mindfulness and voice and all that kind of thing and um as much more about the mind not than the body but the effects of the mind on the body i think is the point and coming at it from oh i whereas, would love whereas, that can i get yeah, that whereas, name from you later yeah, sure barbara houseman 
Absolutely. which um, in comparison to now, Kristen's all about imagery and stuff as well. And again, I'm being very reductive here. Like we could talk with this for hours and hours. I think ultimately she's a remarkable woman and she pioneered an incredible um, method of freeing the natural voice, which is her book. I think now there are lots of other ways that you can go that you can use to enhance or change or develop or explore. Um, and I think one of the, the things that people who have worked with Kristen in depth would have said was that she was always open to discuss the 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 like good bits and the bad bits or the bits that I liked and the bits that I don't. She was always open to discourse about it and encouraged people to investigate it and to um, explore it. But she was coming from a place where she had to be very much like, this is the way you say it. These are the words you use because I I wrote this. Because if you didn't, you know, what was it going to be? And also, if we're talking about, I'm not a big on oh women, men, women, men. But at that time, you ha it's like the the head of Vogue. She once said that being indecisive is the worst thing. So if somebody asks her a question, she says, if it's like, do you like the white one or the black one? She says something. It doesn't okay. matter what you're saying, but you need to know, mm -hmm. stand in your surety of what you're saying. Yeah. And she probably had to do that or she couldn't have survived. Yeah. And I think, yeah, when you're when you're training so many teachers, you've got to say, like, these are the steps. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you know, it's there's so much going on now in voice. It's really exciting. But the bones of what she did and, like, everything still stands. And I use, like, later stuff every day. So... You know? I've got a harmonica that I've added to my warm up. I don't think I'm doing it right, but that can't hurt, right? Do you mean a harmonica? Yeah, I figured I'll teach yeah. myself how to play it. Yeah, great. Yeah. Breath. Huh? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay, we've got another question. I know that I'm asking you, and and please know that there is massive respect behind this. It. I'm asking you to give us in bullet points your 800 years of experience love and passion that you've like died to learn I'm like could you just give us the like the selling points and, and, but it, it's because of the amount of respect i give to what you do that i know that it's like a lifetime's worth of work that mm -hmm. do you know what i mean so yeah of course and that on a call like this we can only get like the very you know top gilding of the lily and then if if you if you want more call nicola okay so <laughs> except she's probably too busy with <laughs> i don't even think i know how to answer the phone anymore what is a phone i know <laughs> with like eight thousand people in your facebook group um we've got another question sarah would like to know what is your oh i'm curious about this too what is your take on the transatlantic accent and what it sounds like <sighs> hmm Right. We did an episode on this for the Voice Over Social podcast. Oh. I think, it, well, Mid Atlantic. Um, or it might be worth listening to, I What's think. The for difference? A, I didn't know there was a difference. So, like, transatlantic is like that. Um, that one from the movies that everybody talks about that's kind of a little bit British and a little bit <laughs> a little bit American. <laughs> from, uh, can it, really don't romantic. let me forget. <laughs> will you give me that podcast episode number so that I can put it in the about section oh, yeah. of the of the we'll video? The so we'll put it in the yeah. show notes, you guys, so you can oh. listen to the oh. podcast. So that was and that came off the back of somebody back in the day trying to make good american like a good american accent and that's sort of like an american stage standard like a good sounding american that then movie stars learn and that was like that's transatlantic that's like old school transatlantic which has sort of morphed and developed and changed into today although people still use the term transatlantic mid-atlantic is sort of the modern term that alludes to something that's neither here nor there in terms of the uk or the us uh, um my take on them generally and we've got lots on the history that we actually talked to eric singer the like amazing accent guy from all the buzzfeed videos who's a bit of a 
girl crush. Crush <laughs> a bite. And we talked to him. He gave, us a really, he gave us a really, really. He's amazing. He gave us a really good like boiling down of the history of transatlantic. And we looked into it, and we got loads of people. Somebody wants to know Catherine Hepburn. Is that mid or trans? M mid trans yeah. trans. Yeah. Okay. Like these days, it's probably be called mid. But if we're talking about listen to the podcast, like because he just gives a really, really good, concise breaking down of it for us. Okay. Um, my take on any of those accents, or is that is that it's as it's as American or British, sorry, as or British based as the listener thinks it is, like. A speaker can only do so much, right? They have this. If it's your natural accent or your habitual accent, it's your habitual accent. You've not chosen most of the time to either sound a little bit more UK or a little bit more US. It's maybe happened because of who you've married or where you've lived or where you've studied or what you've traveled. It's one of those accents. Nobody's born with a mid Atlantic or a transatlantic accent. It is a crafted thing, either consciously or unconsciously. And you can only have so much control over how, how that's perceived. In the same way, you can only have so much control over how any accent's perceived, really, because we all come at accent as a listener with our own unconscious bias based on experience. And you so, do adapt. I can say, because when I moved here, I tried really hard not to sound American because I didn't want to be like one of the ones they laughed at with the Starbucks and the backpack. I wanted to fit in and I was married to a proper, you know, and I think after like a year when the homesickness kicked in and people at work were like making fun of me in a nice, well, okay, not so nice way. Um, the culture clash kicked in, which it does to everyone. I give you like a year mm -hmm. before you start feeling like pissed off. Um, I became so obnoxiously American. My accent became, and it still is, over the top American backpack, Starbucks coffee, and I'm going to be as damn loud as I want. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because you change you adjust depending on where you are for the good or for the bad i think you su maybe subconscious yeah, not, maybe conscious yeah exactly that's a conscious or an unconscious dis decision depending on who you are and who you're around and i know there are people in the room here who are american who also live in the uk and maybe vice versa the few names that are familiar then some are unfamiliar i know and we Diane's do here and she sounds lovely she doesn't have an obnoxious yeah. accent at all Neither do you. Your accent's not obnoxious. Well, no, I'm kind of proud of it. I'm kind of over the top sometimes. <laughs> I like it. It's my, it's my, what is it? Selling point. S-O-P, P-O-S. Point of sale. US, USP? USP. USP. It's my USP. Yeah. Sale yeah. is like a credit card machine. You're yeah. not a credit card machine. No, it's my USP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm the same. Sure, I'm Irish and I live on the, on the mainland, as they call it in Ireland. <laughs> um, and like... I have definitely, but my mom's English, so I grew up with an English influence in my house all the time, even in Ireland. And then I came over here to uni in England, hung up with a lot of English people who thought my accent was hilarious, but that just made me more Irish, I think. And then I started getting hired for my Irish accent. Yeah. But then I married someone who's from Yorkshire and, and, you know, definitely when I'm around them, my accent softens because I love them and they're my tribe. And, you and know, there's no you, way you can compete with the Yorkshire accent. No. No. <laughs> not my father-in-law's anyway <laughs> he's great um so yeah i think any any i suppose my t to answer the question i don't know if i have my take on any accent or on is that um from a studying point of view you got to do what you can get as many samples as you find useful listen lots, play lots, explore lots, research it, seek the help of a coach if, if to, to tweak it or to guide you through step by step. Um, and then you have to trust in the listener, which is hard because a lot of listeners are horrible. <laughs> but there is only so much you can do to um, convince people or to um, sit people in terms of the accent you take on. Um, because we all have our own accent baggage yeah and our own way of approaching it i mean i think because i learned my, i think my last ditch effort was doing your class but i say that in a good way because <laughs> i mean that as a compliment because i knew <laughs> that i was learning the way in and i yeah. knew that it was 
the quality that I wanted. This wasn't like an online whatever. And this was what it takes. And I can do as much or as little as I want to. And I had, I did feel overwhelmed, not because of you, but because the whole thing, because I don't have, because I don't have a, my brain doesn't work that way. The thing about where they lived, that helps me, but it's what you say, everyone finds their own way in. And the parts yeah. that you said about the, the body, you know, but I think every, uh, the only way we know what works and what doesn't work is by trying everything, yeah. right? Taking like, like, and that's, that's what the, that course is about. The, um, we're on week, coming into week four at the moment, actually on that one. Um, and it is about, it's about me going, these are the options. <laughs> Yeah. Do with them what you will. Yeah. And some it's not of like, them just go you have crazy. To do this and you have to do that and you have to do this and you have to do that. And yeah. if you don't do this, yeah. you're wrong. Like it's, these are the things that you can approach. These are the things that we use as accent coaches to help and, you. And that's why I walked away feeling like I'd gotten my money's worth. It wasn't like it was like a ton of money anyway, but it was like walked away. <laughs> but, but if you had said, this is the only way to do it, you do this. And I was feeling overwhelmed. And my brain is like, how am I going to remember all this while I'm trying to do it? I would have felt kind of ripped off. I would have felt like I didn't get my money's worth. But you don't. You present it all. Here's a big grab mix. Take what helps you. Leave yeah. the rest. You know, because the people that go to your class are hardcore, some of them. They would get on that, like, group afterwards and go, okay, now, the accent on the consonant on the vowel in that small no, tribal gigs, community in that weird little island that is no longer called such and such <laughs> and i'd be yeah. like <laughs> everybody's different you know and even me as a coach now you know you sort of you, you get to know the sort of coaching that you like doing like yeah. i love getting really intricate and tidying things up for people like if people come to me and they're like is it leeds or is it sheffield you know like i love the really intricate stuff but i also and again, I think this boils down to my like, everyone should know how to do this kind of thing. Is that like, my whole approach as a coach is to give you the tools to not need me, <laughs> like in the end. I'm too busy. I can't see everybody. So like my whole thing with that course is it's not like a course where you learn to do one accent. It's here are the things you can use to help yourself learn any accent. And actually that's what's quite good for audiobook narrators, I think, because you can start to pick and choose and have a little play. Um, and it's, and it's, it's really lead a horse to water and teach them how to drink or whatever. That's the thing, yeah, yeah. because we're going to, the accent we need today is going to be a totally different one next week. And yeah. we need to know how to teach us. And also the vocal warm ups that you gave me. I, you gave me the power to learn which part of my face and neck and throat and tongue I had to relax. Yeah. And that's what I needed. That was it. Instead of yeah. 17, I went to a, a vocal person once. And she gave me a kazoo and she had me with straws and I still have that kazoo. I've never once used it. I'm like, I don't really get the kazoo thing. I don't understand this, but you explained what to do and it was easy. Maybe somebody will hire yeah. you and teach me what to do with a kazoo. <laughs> I probably could. Yeah. I mean, there are, the, thing, the other thing as well, which was I find really interesting is that well, there are two things I wanted to say. One was that everybody also constantly um changes the position i come from as a learner as well so you know that i talked about how when i first did voice training as a student i wasn't into it I was like what the hell is this I was lying on the floor swinging my leg around going blah, 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 and i just did not understand what i was doing i wasn't in a place to learn it it was first year uni spent a lot of the time with a lot of vodka red bull in my system wasn't in the right place for it that teacher did the best he could with the material he was presented with weirdly i still work with that teacher now 20 years later because he also has changed his practice <laughs> he's amazing right but then when i got there to do my ma i was like i am so open to this now i'm here for this i feel confident saying i don't know i feel happy saying i need some more on that and and it, it puts you in a very different place so i think you know in in relation to whoever else was teaching you it's not that i'm going to sit here and go well, you weren't in the right place to learn or well she was obviously shite like there's yeah. a lot of factors that have to be like in place for a really conducive learning environment to happen and that's why i you. wasn't in the right place to learn and exactly. she was pretty good yeah and the, <laughs> i was yeah yeah like i was exactly. in a horrible place but clowning when you bring that up that reminds me of me going to clowning every single thing about clowning terrified me i hated it 
and I loved it. I was like, I was there 10 minutes before every class. Mm. I was obsessed, obsessed. Talked about yeah. it 24 hours a day. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's I don't want to lose this. It's going up in this in the line. What is your favorite from Fiona? What is your favorite vocal warm up? Do you have a favorite one? Um. Oh, I'm obviously a big fan of jaw release. I don't know if anybody, did. I'm sure some people here did jaw release week way, way, way back when. And I've got it coming out as a download in like a few weeks time. So I'm very Ooh, excited I about do that. Because I missed Share you. the word. Um, so anything to do with jaw release. But if I could give people one, one exercise, which is really good for warming up, really good for cooling down, really good for breath, really good for vocal full closure, is really safe and efficient. It would be one from, um, uh, so it's actually from a speech and language therapy perspective. And it was taught to me as part of some accent method of breathing that I did, nothing to do with accents, is it as a type of breathing. Okay. Um, and it's a really gentle puffy slide up and down your vocal range. So it's this, <sighs> because it comes from the semi-occluded vocal tract exercise category. So it's really safe. You get that nice acoustic back pressure down. What they're trying to get with a kazoo, Daniela, and what they're trying to get with a straw, very similar. Um, do, you still, but you don't do, do you still do those kazoo. classes? Because I have a bit right here where my voice, if it goes right here, I cough. I lose my voice right here. Like I can go up high and I can go down low, but I go to one level and my voice goes yeah. i'd say you, you probably need a little stuff yeah i'd say well kazoo straw stuff you probably need a little bit of sliding up and down a little bit of um semi-occluded vocal tract work is really nice for if there's any little kinks or bumps or little things in the vocal folds unless there's you know having checked there's no serious pathology going on just gently easing through that and just kind of smoothing things out oh i'm gonna so book, anything... can I book you again are you too busy i'll wait till ac can. after the accent class <laughs> okay yeah i think i'm booking in august i think i'm, I'm booking in august um but then i'll be yeah, yeah. so yeah, like yeah, there are things you can do um, so I think that one, I'm not sure who asked that question, but I think that nice gentle glide up and down. Ooh, it's also really adaptable because you can lie on the floor and do nice gentle um, size of relief through it, which is really nice for initial touch of sound and getting that checking in with the support mechanism as well and making sure that the support muscles are working and all that kind of stuff. It's really nice for warming up, cooling down, resets, all that kind of stuff. It encourages space, releasing the muscles, ease of onset. It's beautiful. I like the tongue one. Monday, Tuesday. I love yeah. that one. <laughs> Slug time. Yeah, that's good. That's a good one. That's a good one. That's good. And of course, I love Pout Nana Cat's Bum Clown. That's one of my favorites, which is free lips. Pout, Pout Nana Cat's Bum Clown. <laughs> we shouldn't use the word clown because I forgot we've got Sarah here, who's another clown, and she's going crazy now. The whole message board is going about clowns. <laughs> <laughs> as long as no one's afraid of clowns i got myself in trouble once with that. <laughs> okay so clap so pat, okay pout. Well, gonna... pout your lips nana uh -oh. nana as in grandma no lips except i've got lipstick on i would end up with it on my Pat's teeth <laughs> <laughs> that's it and like it's really that. good. Works all the different muscle groups in your lips: abicularis oris, levators, depressors, buccinators. I like that. It probably stops the wrinkles too. Yeah, it's really good for all that. I'm 65. <laughs> <laughs> My running joke for that. <laughs> wrinkles. I love that. That is actually quite funny. Except the thing is, yeah. the day you turn 65, you'll probably regret that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll change it to like 105. <laughs> I know Never I do that. Older. I do that. When you reach my age and everyone's like, how old is she? 99 years old. <laughs> Never felt older than when I taught in drama schools because in my head, I'm still like 18, guys. Yeah. But when you get into drama school and you're like, hey, dudes, and they're like, wow, your eyebrows are sick or whatever. I mean, even that's outdated now. And I'm like, they said something, they said my hair was peng or something at one point. I was like, isn't that a place in, in like Hertfordshire? <laughs> Yeah, I, I did. 
I did like a survival job when I first became a narrator. I thought, well, how am I going to make money? I'm so I got a job at a hair salon and I was a little bit older. And A, they got pissed off that I kept putting 80s music on the like overhead sound. <laughs> I was like, I'm being ironic. But then you would say something. I think I mentioned Bridget Bardot and nobody knew who she was. And that can't go well in the end. You start to feel old. <laughs> I did a, co a, cl a class for some young kids that were like eight to 15 or something. And I was like, I used a Beyonce reference, nothing. I was like, tell me, knowing who Beyonce is doesn't make me old. Tell me that's not happened no, already. They have to know everybody, Beyonce is. everybody knows who Beyonce is. I was like, give me your, uh, give me your Beyonce, you know, wiggle your bum. I like Beyonce. They were like, who's that? Who's that? Who's in your Porsche? I was like, oh my God, Ariana Grande? <laughs> I'm like, still young and hip, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to have to pull it on my cold, dead hands. <laughs> oh, oh no. Terrible. Anyway. So, okay, so you're happy now. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful baby, helping people daily, doing something you love. You are yeah. a boss. How did you become how did you become a sellout podcast star? I mean, because that's literally the level you're at now. And you obviously didn't plan it because you keep acting surprised. <laughs> like well, I think I think the minute you go, yeah, I knew that was gonna happen. Is the day you have to like catch yourself on, oh, like you could. Yeah, but you go. You oh my God! Seriously, <laughs> I mean, you're like yeah, a drunk, like, Nicola. <laughs> I think I'm always. I'm, I think I'll always be shocked. I think I'll always be shocked that you know people like to listen to me all the time talking about voice. Do you know what I mean? But it's then like top I mean, worldwide or something, audience. isn't it? It's like top yeah, ten it's like worldwide. One percent, one percent. Yeah, I mean that goes up and down. One percent, one point five percent. But like getting anywhere near that, podcasts are the biggest thing in the world right now. Yeah, but but top podcasts that are consistent and updated yeah. and downloaded and listened to with a regular audience are not. <laughs> you know, like this is what people don't realize when they go into podcasting is that it's really hard <laughs> like it's you got to be consistent you've got to choose find your audience you got to get it to your audience you've got to get listeners you've got to get sponsors like the work that leah does behind the scenes for the voice coach the voice over social podcast is off the hook like all i do in her words are come along and sparkle over it <laughs> <laughs> like hey, she always <laughs> she does everything and she's amazing and she's a really investigative journalist and in a sense and she she asks the right question and she knows the like what we wanted from that podcast was to make it something that's useful and relevant and current and important and necessary for the voiceover industry we didn't want it there are lots of great voiceover podcasts out there and based on a premise of talking to other voiceovers or people in the industry and that is lovely mm -hmm. and that's sort of where we started in a way although we always did ours ever so slightly differently just to break things up but now we feel like it's become something a lot more at least to us and it seems to for our listeners so you know it's the ai talking to yeah talking to bed standing and talking to equity and having equity give us their insights from what's going on with quoting and 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 for us it's it's just really important in an industry where there's so much flux at the moment as there always is in lots of industries but there's so much going on influx of loads of new people ai what the heck like loads of stuff going on and we just feel like it's we've made it our responsibility in our own little way to try and you know get that out there and ask the right questions. And Leah puts her heart and soul into making that podcast honest and authentic and important. And then I just come along and tell a few jokes. Well, <laughs> from all of here. us, will you please tell Leah, thank you very much that we love her and we love you. Of course, I will. And then the other one is a very simple concept in the sense of it's me boiling down bits of my knowledge, 10, 15 minutes a week, bosh it out, done. I mean, there's more to it than that, but like, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. The more. whole point of that is like an accessibility thing. So, you know, some people want to work with me and they can't afford it yet. And that's just the way it is. 
Um, so they, ha- they can listen to the podcast. They can join the Facebook group. They can do jaw release course. They can do the accent course, you know, and at the point when they're ready um, to invest in a bit more one-to-one stuff that's a bit more expensive or come to a retreat, the next one's in September, <laughs> um, then, then they can step up and do that. But my point is like, I don't feel like, I don't want what I do and the, the, the knowledge that I've worked really hard to hone and still keep up to date all of the time, I don't feel like that should be reserved for the people who can afford X amount per hour, you know? I want to be able to give, you know, I sound like fucking Florence Nightingale, but you know what I mean? Like, no, I just but want... it's, it's the why. Yeah. It's, it's why we keep coming back to what we do. Yeah. And I think you're talking really... to an audience of people that if we didn't do the why, we wouldn't stand for eight hours doing what we do. I mean, no, yeah. no audience is going to understand what you're saying more than a group of narrators. Um, oh, yeah. I have another question from Fiona. It's quite an important one, and I'm sorry I didn't bring it up earlier in the call. Um, but I, I think this is one that needs to be addressed. Hold on one second. Um, question, what's your favorite joke to tell? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not one of mine. Not one of mine. Um, I want to tell you my mom's favorite joke as well because it's completely stupid and ridiculous and probably gives you an idea of why (laughs) I'm the the way I am. But her uh, her favorite joke is, I can't even believe I'm going to share this. Her favorite joke is, she's from Lancashire. What's that over there? Well, it's not a tomato. (laughs) That's it. That's the joke, right? Well, it's not a tomato. Love that. It doesn't even sound like that. makes it funny. funny. No, no, no. Uh, my favorite joke is um, very much based on the Northern Irish accent, and it goes like this: Two cows in a field. Which one's going on holiday? The one with the wee calf. Week off. Week <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone. Go. <laughs> Which is the reaction that joke gets? I like that. Well, the, we, our high school was pretty strict, but it was wasn't Catholic, so there weren't. You couldn't do any shocking, dirty jokes for the nuns because there weren't any nuns. <laughs> okay, I don't know how we yeah. got on this topic. So the most important thing before I let you go for the evening, can you please give us some final words of wisdom to the audience that's going to be watching you in sixty or seventy years? <laughs> <laughs> As I trundle along in cheesecloth. <laughs> they hydrated. Um, um, words of wisdom. I think um, awareness. I think it's really important to cultivate a really honest awareness of where you are with your voice. Um, don't be worried or concerned if you're having any issues or some people I think see it as a bit of a weakness if they need voice help mm. um, and that's, that's not the case you know all professional voice users and everyone here is an athlete you know they're your vocal athlete and I think it's really important to understand that and there's a bit of a movement going on with uh, Rena Gupta and some and the Sphere project and Mindy Pack and some stuff that's like do the work before so much of our work is cure rather than prevention and it's actually a real luxury to work with someone who doesn't have a problem they're just interested in exploring and and like making their voice better so um yeah prevention rather than cure i think is really powerful and easier yeah believe I, me i've never done it that way before maybe i should no. try people don't with voice they don't they come to you going can you help me it's like <laughs> give me one million dollars <laughs> Yeah. And yes, if I will. Like a, I've lost a bit of my voice. How long ago? Ten years. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think the other one is stay hydrated for fact's sake. <laughs> I love that. That's brilliant. <laughs> That's brilliant. I love that. Drink. Thank you very much, Nicola. This was You're so welcome. the most Thanks informative Ask Anything. This was a fabulous fun Aww. call. Thank you. So it shall be out in two weeks on the playlist, guys. Um, check out Nicola's accent course. It's A number well, it's, one. It's on at the moment, so you can't really check that one out. Check out the retreats. If anyone wants to come to my house and hang out and do voice stuff. Yeah, for all you huggers that have been like dying to see people in person, go to the retreat. <laughs> so much hugging. So, so many people hope. are like dying for that. And also yeah. um, boy, vocal coaching, 
which yeah yeah come on over me. like i said i'm booking into august at the moment from yeah. august because it's like school holidays and i'm having a holiday a whole week wow well i hope you enjoy it and that's we're used to booking far in advance so we'll be fine nice to get a little vocal warm-up before the fall before back to yeah, school definitely. thank you oh, thank very everyone much. it's been wonderful I've, i feel like i've learned so much already and i i thought that i knew it all <laughs> just kidding obviously the girl that doesn't do her homework no i have learned a lot i really have and also i think and after the session I had with you that time, and after your accent course, not in the beginning, but in the end, I left with a feeling of it's fun and I can do everything that I can do, rather than a feeling of, oh my God, I'm going to fail at this. It's too much. And you instill that in people. And I love oh, that. Very nice. And we need that. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> oh. But confidence is everything. If we don't have yeah. it when we get in the booth, it shows. And that's what you give to us. And I think that's, it's invaluable. But don't underestimate the importance of your headspace in that too, Daniela. You know, you you give yourself permission to, to, to go away feeling like that. And I think yeah. that says a lot about you as a learner. So, yeah. Yeah. It took a long time, but it is, it's everything. It's just mm -hmm. the more mellow we are, the better in the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. I probably need to shut up at this point for anyone that actually knows me. <laughs> probably. <don't. laughs> so this shall be on YouTube. Thank you very much. What is it they say in yoga? Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining. You're Bye. all amazing. Bye, Nicola. Bye. Bye, guys. Come on, everybody, tap along. First you scrub a dub, then you tap and rub. You might have to yell when you hear the bell ring out loud and long.